Anyone who's familiar with the weather down here in Florida, especially this time of year, knows that this is about as bipolar as that can get because literally I was right here two hours ago and I attempted to shoot this video and not even five minutes into it got slammed with a massive thunderstorm. I knew it was coming but you never really know when it's going to come. You can kind of see it out there and then sometimes it'll just dissipate and take off and it'll, it'll, it'll never come and other times you just get wham, you get slammed with it like I did. So we just got this massive rainstorm and now look at this guys, look how it looks out here. You would never know that we just got this massive thunderstorm, you know, two hours ago. Insanity. But I'm glad I was able to get out here and get the video in. And by the way, thanks for the house, mom and dad. <laughs> now I am just joking around here because I did not inherit a house from my parents. But that can't be said for many other people who do inherit houses from their parents or other family members that pass down their house to others. And I thought this would be an interesting thing to cover today for a couple different reasons. The first reason is it's interesting to take a look at what people actually do with these properties once they get them. But the other reason it's interesting to take a look at is because this is likely going to be the largest source of inventory in the housing market over the next decade or so. It's hard to find good spots to walk because there's still the flooded sidewalks and everything here so I'm kind of just dodging all this as much as I can. Now in my experience as a real estate agent pretty much nine times out of ten when I've seen somebody inherit a property it doesn't take them that long to then go ahead and list the place for sale and that's mainly because most of the time people just want the money they don't want the inherited property and especially today with the way that the costs are with real estate when it comes to property taxes the utilities the upkeep you know it's going to be very difficult for people to maintain these properties that they end up inheriting i think no matter which way i go i'm going to have to walk through some of this nasty water whatever i got sandals on now the other problem with people whenever they inherit property is let's say you have a couple of siblings and the property was passed down to you and your sister and your brother, like three of you, right? And say two out of the three of you wants to sell it and the other one wants to keep it. Well, the one who wants to keep it pretty much has no choice but to buy out the other two thirds of the property from their siblings if they want to hang on to it. And with where real estate valuations are at today, that might just not be possible. And also with the way home prices are, because real estate is still so expensive, it makes selling the property a very attractive option for many people who inherit a property, let's face it. And I have to say guys, like obviously when your parents pass away, it has to be like pretty much one of the saddest things that's ever gonna happen in your, in your life. And it's something that we all have to face. Now the reality is most people plan on leaving their homes to their children when they pass away. In fact, Charles Schwab just did a survey this year and they found out that 75% of Americans plan on leaving their home to their children when they die. But just as interesting from this survey, when they survey the children, okay, about 70% of the children surveyed said that when they receive the property, they're planning on selling it. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because, like I said, this is a very big source of listings coming in the future because most of the people that inherit these properties are just going to want to sell it and take the money. No matter what their motivations are for that, doesn't really matter. The point is that's inventory coming to the housing market. Now, a good example of this is a story that came out today from Charleston, South Carolina, where two sisters inherited their parents' home that they actually built. They built this home in Charleston from brand new, and today that house is worth three and a half million dollars, okay? So not a bad inheritance. And the problem with it is their father wanted to build the house and have that house passed on to generation to generation, okay? They wanted to keep the house in the family. That was the father's wishes, so to speak. And unfortunately, these two sisters that inherited the property are not gonna be able to fulfill that wish because both of them 
are empty nesters and they do not have the income to keep up with this property okay the place is 4,000 square feet the cost to maintain a home like this as you can imagine is astronomical and then you're talking about a coastal property like in South Carolina where the insurance is also extremely expensive just like here in Florida and <clears throat> it just makes it so it's not financially feasible to keep the house. I'm sure this is something that their father never anticipated whenever he said that you know he wanted them to keep the house and the family because it's one thing to want that and wish that for your family when you build the house but I'm sure there's no way they could have imagined you know 50 60 years ago when they built this house that one day it was going to be worth three and a half million in 2023 and that the insurance on it would just be too much for their daughters to keep up with and actually pay for, let alone all the other maintenance costs that come with a 4,000 square foot house. And you can call this greed or lack of financial responsibility or anything like that on behalf of the children whenever they cash out and sell these properties against maybe their parents' wishes, but put yourself in their position when the place is worth three and a half million dollars and you literally can't afford to keep up with the property taxes and the maintenance that go along with it, it's the only decision available. Now, of course, there's always gonna be people where they're evil and financially motivated and don't care what their parents or their family members wanted and will go against those wishes anyhow and just do whatever they want. But the interesting thing from this study, what they found was that when a vacation property is inherited or more like a second home that a family member had like say a condo down here in florida would be a good example of that and that's the ones i've had the most experience with people are far more likely to hang on to those properties at least for a little while and kind of enjoy the benefits of that until the costs catch up with them on that as well because when you inherit you know grandma's old house that you know has the furniture and decorations from 50 years ago people aren't very incentivized to keep a place like that but if grandma had a beachfront condo down here in florida with an ocean view then that might be something that people are more inclined to try to keep for a little while longer and come down and use it as a second home like grandma did especially you know if there's no mortgage and all you got to do is pay the upkeep but even that can be too costly guys because within this story there is actually a situation just like that where three brothers inherited a condo that their grandmother used to own that's on the beach in Boca Raton, Florida. And their initial plan was to keep the property and rent it out and turn it into an investment property, right? But because the property taxes and the insurance and now the HOA fees on these condos skyrocketing, they decided to just sell it and be done with it because they're worried about the expenses and they weren't sure if they could turn a profit. These guys aren't really real estate investors, so they just decided to sell and take the money. And speaking of all these costs being too high, this might be the next nail in the coffin for people who actually inherit these properties and really change their mind on trying to even think about keeping any of them because Florida just passed a couple of new laws recently and one of them is pertaining to homeowners insurance this is a big story down here that you know i'm keeping you guys posted on and this is the latest thing now the first thing is they just expanded my safe florida home program this is so that people can get their home inspected for any potential damage that a hurricane might cause and this inspection is done totally for free and they give you recommendations on things that you can do to improve the property and reduce potential damage from the next storm okay and then with this inspection the state now will give you a credit of two dollars for every one dollar you spend up to ten thousand dollars towards those repairs so say you need to spend 30 grand to retrofit the house to make it safer during the next hurricane well you can get ten thousand of that thirty thousand from the state of florida to do these type of repairs but the major changes that you have to be aware of especially if you don't have a homestead tax exemption on your home here in florida is that homeowners that do have a homestead exemption okay they have what's called a glide path to higher rates as citizens needs to increase the rates to keep up with the rising costs of replacement and damages down here well 
this is not going to apply to non-homesteaded properties here in Florida. So during the next renewal, then you can almost guarantee that your insurance bill is going to skyrocket here in Florida if you don't have a homestead exemption on your property. And this applies to anybody that doesn't have a homestead, guys. Doesn't matter if you inherited it from somebody that used to live there and they did have a homestead. It doesn't matter if it's a second home that you own. It doesn't matter if it's an investment property. If you don't live there, and you don't have a homestead exemption, get ready for the rates to start climbing even further. And this is gonna be effective as of July 1st of this year. So right around the corner, basically just a month from now. And I think this is gonna have a devastating effect on the Florida property market here in general. Like people like to pick on condos, thinking that it's only gonna be condos affected guys. But the reality is, this is gonna affect all non-homesteaded properties here in Florida. Because already, those non-homesteaded properties have a much higher property tax burden than homesteaded properties. You pay far more when you don't have the homestead exemption, okay? That was already the case. Now, you're gonna be starting to pay more in insurance. This is gonna be a huge disincentive for property investors here. I mean, generally speaking, you're always gonna pay more to insure a property that's an investment property, but now the gloves are off with this and it's gonna be a lot more. And what I'm wondering is, is this gonna lead to more people selling their investment properties here in Florida because you can only deal with so many increases before you either don't want to deal with it anymore or the property is no longer profitable you know and it's not turning a profit because so much of the money is going towards expenses so if you think investor activity has slowed down and taking a nosedive now just wait until this really goes into effect and people start getting their new homeowners insurance policies it's going to be even worse that's what i'm thinking even me personally like i want to buy more real estate and invest in more real estate when i find the right deals and i think the time is right but at this point in time i'm pretty much willing to say that i don't want to buy any more real estate here in florida unless it's my primary residence for investment it's just too risky guys like the expenses are such a huge question mark right now. Even if you run the numbers and you do everything perfect and you think you got it down and you know what it's gonna cost, that can easily be flipped upside down in a year from now when the next change drops or you know we have another hurricane and insurance premiums double again or you know the property taxes continue to go up because you're not homesteaded and they can rise by 10% a year. Like there's just too many problems with it and I don't wanna take the risk. Some other people might want to, but not me. It really is amazing to me that a three bedroom, three bath house like this, nothing out of the ordinary, just an average house can command $2.7 million just because it's a few steps away from the beach. They listed this house less than a month ago, so it's a new listing. Property tax bill here right now is $25,000 a year, and that is with no homestead exemption. Now here's something else I saw today that I just had to bring up. Barbara Corcoran, the Shark Tank lady, and she also started the Corcoran Real Estate Company, okay? Well, this is what she said this week in the news. She says, it's a good time to buy a house because the minute that interest rates go down, everybody's waiting for them to go down. And by that point, they're going to come rushing back into the market. And prices are going to explode and you're going to be paying more for the same house and don't forget you can always refinance when and if interest rates come down that's what she said this week a lot of you probably already know what i'm going to say about this but here's my take on this first of all when interest rates start coming back down the reason for that is going to be the fed has made a pivot and when the fed does pivot that's going to be the turning point of when the economy is really going to be in the toilet. That is a guarantee. That's what's gonna happen. When you start seeing interest rates come back down, that's where we're gonna be at, guys. There's gonna be no soft landing. It's gonna be the Fed desperately trying to reverse all the damage that's been done, which is not gonna happen. So maybe the people that can actually afford to go out and buy under those circumstances and are not affected by the massive recession that we're gonna be in, then sure, maybe they're gonna go out and buy. But it's not gonna be everybody. Just look at 2008, guys. Look what happened back then 
whenever all the deals started coming on the market and interest rates were going back down, did the buyers flood back into the market? No, they didn't. And inventory was high, places would sit on the market, take forever to sell, and people were not flooding back into the market because people didn't have jobs. People were trying to just keep food on the table and keep the roof over their head that they already had. You know what I'm saying? And as far as the advice about you can always refinance when and if the interest rates go down, well, she just said it right there herself. If, if, what if they don't go down, okay? What if interest rates don't go back down for a while? can't refinance then. What about you're buying the property today and she's wrong and the price doesn't explode and it just keeps going down. Oh, you can't refinance? Why not? Oh, because your house is now worth less than what you paid for it in 2023. Hmm. I wish I didn't do that. I took Barbara's advice. And you know what else is interesting about Barbara, guys, is she started her real estate company in 1973 with a $1,000 loan. So that's like her success story with all of this. And what a lot of people don't realize is she actually sold the Corcoran Real Estate Company in 2001 for $66 million. So it's easy to come out and give people all this bogus advice when you didn't have to go through any of the downturns yourself. Her business didn't go through the 2008 downturn. She was already out, guys, by 2001. So she was in it when the getting was good for all these years. So it's pretty easy to say that, oh, prices are gonna explode when interest rates come down because that's all she knows. That's all she's ever seen happen throughout her career. But we're in a different world now. Things are so upside down and what used to be true no longer is. Now, anyone who thinks that's crazy, it gets worse because here's the other thing that she said, okay? Somebody asked her, how do you win bidding wars under this environment right now? She said that the key is to look like the best deal in town while playing on the seller's emotions. So you have to be pre-qualified for a mortgage so you can go in there as an all-cash deal. I'm an all-cash deal. It's not contingent. I already got my mortgage. You want that power behind you. Now, let's analyze what this means for you as the buyer. I don't think most people realize just how dangerous this advice is that Barbara is giving people. Because what essentially she's telling you to do is to get pre-qualified for your mortgage, which is basically almost a guarantee that you're going to get the loan. And then you go in and you make a cash offer on the property instead of a financed offer. Well, why is this a bad idea? I will tell you. because. When you come into the contract as an all cash offer, first of all, the seller's usually gonna require proof of funds. They wanna see that you can actually pay cash for the house. And since you're basically lying and saying that you're paying cash when you're not, you're not gonna be able to prove this. And that can be the end of the deal right there. But let's assume for a second that the seller doesn't ask for proof and they accept your all cash offer and you're coming in even though you're financing, okay? Well, you just waived your financing contingency on that property, meaning that if for whatever reason something happens throughout this process and you can't get the mortgage, you're on the hook to buy the property anyways, guys. Oh, you can't? Um, I actually don't have the cash and the mortgage fell through. Tough luck. Now you're going to lose your escrow deposit. That's, where, that's the position that this puts you in that Barbara's telling people. So remember this advice, okay? Remember this story that we're talking about right now because this is her advice, not mine. And I'm telling you guys this as a huge warning to be careful when you hear some of these so-called real estate experts say these things because to me, guys, that's honestly some of the worst real estate advice I've ever heard, okay? And I don't know her personally, obviously, or have anything against her, but when you're coming out and telling buyers to enter into a deal as a cash offer, even though you're financing and giving up that contingency puts you in a very vulnerable and quite frankly, dangerous position as the buyer. And here's the other thing that you need to understand as the buyer, even if you're willing to go through with this strategy and you're confident that you're gonna get the loan and you can get away with making this fake cash offer, well, 
Anything can happen, guys, that can actually make you not get the loan at the last second, okay? We see this credit crunch happening right now. The lender can just change their mind and say, no, we're not writing any new mortgages, kind of like what Wells Fargo did recently. Or something happens and there was some kind of snafu with paying one of your bills and you get a late payment recorded on your credit report and now that mortgage pre-qualification gets revoked because they pull your credit again before closing and they see, oh, you were 30 days late on this payment, even if it was a mistake, doesn't matter. You're not pre-qualified anymore and you're five days away from closing. You know what I'm saying? So this is a very, <laughs> it's a very sketchy thing to recommend to people. And that's why I'm here uh, giving you the heads up on these things and just warning you because these are powerful people giving out this type of advice. And this is not something that I would recommend most people would try, guys. You're, you're pretty much gambling at that point. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful uh, with the things that you read and the advice that you hear, even from well-qualified, you know, big name people out there, because you never know what their financial incentive or motive is when saying these things. And sometimes people just say anything to sound good on TV. They just want to sound right. You know what I mean? They don't want to be wrong. So next time you hear or read something like this and uh, you think it sounds kind of sketchy, make sure you come back and watch one of my videos first to see what I had to say about it and uh, go from there. <laughs> if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't want to wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one.